Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this commemorative program. I'm Milton Wilson, Dean for Human Relations, and it's my privilege to introduce Dick Gregory. Before Mr. Gregory comes before us, let me say a few things about him. Comedian, author, lecturer, actor, human being. Dick Gregory is a man with a message, a message of freedom and equality, a message about the need to close the gap between what is and what ought to be. He knows what it is to spend time in jail for protesting against inequities and evil. He's marched in more demonstrations and has worked harder for the rights of black folks and young folks than any other entertainer in America. But more than a commentator, more than an author, more than a comedian, he is a soldier in a war against hate and bigotry. His weapons include a complete personal dedication of his talent and a razor-sharp sense of humor. His home is in five suitcases, a garment bag and a tape recorder. He lives en route, stopping to play countless benefits deliver church sermons, lobby in Washington, and speak to colleges and universities all over the country. The Ku Klux Klan said that he's the man they hate most. But he claims they're out of style. In fact, they're the only group in this country not using colored sheets. Dick is an author. Many of you are familiar with his best-selling book, Nigger. Every time that word is used, it's an advertisement for that book. The Shadow That Scares Me, Write Me In, and his most recent book, No More Lies. The game is over. Eh? very penetrating study of the myths that tend to govern and delude us. Ladies and gentlemen, will you join me in welcoming Dick Gregory. like to say thank you very much. <clears throat> Can you people wave back in the cheap seats here, okay? <laughs> I don't know how I can really stand here with a straight face and say it's a pleasure to be in Kent, Ohio. <laughs> but I'm here. And you do look normal. <laughs> I, uh, 
you really want to have some fun, you should go to Chicago or New York or California and go to the airport and try to book yourself into the city of Kent, Ohio. <laughs> I, I really believe they treat hijackers better. You know. And hell, I didn't know you didn't have an airport here. I don't know. <laughs> but the airlines, they, don't even, they wouldn't even admit they fly this way. <laughs> and so a guy slipped up to me, you know, and he said, uh, uh, once it was obvious I was coming here, the CIA been on me for the last five days, you know. And they're pretty helpful because he got to get here and he know he can't get here till I get here, right? So he says, uh, try United, right? And so I run to the ticket counter. He said, no, don't go to the ticket counter. No airline, no major airline admits they fly in that direction. You have to call them, right? So I get on the phone, I call and say, you're not an airline. I said, what time is your next flight going towards Kent, Ohio? She said, what time can you get here? <laughs> and, and, and speaking of CIA and all the, the uh, security we have here today, not the open security, the ones that, that really sit there and really think we don't know who they are. <laughs> See, it's, uh, <laughs> but that's hip because that's the mark of a scared, sick, insane nation. I always think somebody, well, you ever been around crazy people? I always think somebody's gonna do something to them. <laughs> Because as crazy and as sick as they are, they know something should happen to them. <laughs> but out of all the cats that, 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 that follow you around and this and that, a lot of people got uptight when the news broke about the Army spying on civilians. Now, I guess the reason it didn't bother me was uh, it all depends on what newspaper you happen to read it in. And most papers said, you know, it's been found out that the Army spying on civilians. I read it in the Chicago Tribune, and the headlines was Army Intelligence Spying on Civilians. Now, if you know anything about the Army, <laughs> you know there's no such thing as intelligence. Huh? <laughs> and so, you know, matter of fact, if I had a choice on who I wanted to spy on me, I would pick Army <laughs> Intelligence. I mean, they follow me around campus. Can you always tell the Army Intelligence cat that's sitting out in the yard? He's always the guy with the brand new beard, price tag hanging out. You know. <laughs> Got the hippie beads tangled up in his dog tags. You know. <laughs> and if you really want to spot him, look at his feet. Who else would wear spit shine sandals? <laughs> Matter of fact, I had one of them cats from Army Intelligence came by my house one day to put a bug on the phone. He was so dumb and stupid, he knocked on the door. Said, yeah, what do you want? Dick Gregory? I said, yeah, what do you want? He said, just don't want to get the wrong phone. <laughs> and you know what I really can't understand? I have every government agency in America is tapping my phone. You know? CIA, the FBI, a bunch of cats we ain't never heard of. I got all the state police in Illinois, the local police in Chicago. I even got little peons, sheriff, deputies with a bug on my phone. And, and you ask yourself, for what? You know, I mean, I ain't into nothing. And I mean, they know, I know they tapping the phone. And after being with me two days on the tap, you learn one thing, if nothing else, that is, I got enough intelligence to know you tapping the phone and not to say anything on the phone I don't want you to hear. So when anytime anybody's tapping your phone and you know they're tapping it, you can have more fun with them than they can have with you. <laughs> like the fact I'm at Kent University today, they got the heavy cats on my line today, right? So what did I do when I got here? I called my wife a few minutes ago and read the alphabets off backwards to her. <laughs> now they'd be up all night long trying to crack that code, right? <laughs> and when you really want to have fun on my phone is during the ride season. 
Oh, but let me explain. By the way, black folks, we the only ones in the world they give a ride season to. <laughs> July through August. <laughs> and last year we didn't show. <laughs> and all the government officials was uptight. Where were you? We had the tanks waiting for you. <laughs> I tell you where we was last ride season. We got tired of stealing all them old bad, no good products. <laughs> so last ride season, we decided to go underground and study the consumer report. <laughs> so when the ride season opened up again, we ain't stealing no more Motorola's. <laughs> and for you agents in the house, take this back to your boss, we just might have some winter rides this year. <laughs> That'll fake them out, wouldn't it? There won't be nothing to turn on television one day and see black folks looting on skis. <laughs> like I said, when you really want to have fun on my tap phone, it's during the ride season, July through August. And, and last August, I got on the phone, everybody was nervous, wondering when it was gonna happen, and I dialed a cat in New York from my house and put my baby on the phone that can't talk. <laughs> Can you imagine what went through this cat's mind there? Yeah. He on the tap, listening to something going, <laughs> I can just see him now, hey, the niggas is planning something big today. <laughs> now, a lot of times I go on television shows and a lot of people seem to say, well, why do you want to accuse the federal government of tapping your phone? I say, because I know they tapped my phone. I say, well, yeah, what evidence do you have? Well, it's my phone. I mean, if you got a tap on your phone, you know it. This one television show, the guy said, well, I don't think you should accuse the federal government of tapping your phone if you don't have no evidence. I said, well, I got some evidence. He said, well, tell us what I, I don't want. I'm to tell you, I know my phone's tapped. And he kept on bugging me, and I, I finally told him, Anytime I get ready to call my brother and reach for the phone and he already on the line. <laughs> and he ain't got no phone. <laughs> Something going on wrong. Guy told me that wasn't enough evidence. I said, man, I know my phone is tapped. He kept saying, how do you know? I said, anytime a nigga in America can owe Bell Telephone $12,000 and they won't cut the phone off, it's tapped. <laughs> And they keep sending letters to my house. Y'all care to pay anything on the bill this year? <laughs> hey, let me say to you youngsters today, it's a pleasure to be with you. I guess I can truthfully say that I spent about 98% of my time today on college campuses, and for a reason. The simple reason is that you young folks in America today is probably the most morally honest, ethical, dedicated, committed group of young people that's ever lived in the history of this country, born none. I say to you youngsters today, you got a big job. You have a big job because the very faith and destiny of America today Depends on you young folks. Oh, you hear him talking about the problems confronting America today? I say to you youngsters who's gonna have to solve these problems that every major problem confronting America today was created by man, which means these problems can be solved overnight if you young folks decide to solve these problems using honest, ethical statesmanship ability and not this sick, tired, degenerate political muscle. That's what the problem is today in America, the same slimy, degenerate political forces that's created the problems is not telling us they can't solve the problems. And I say you damn right, the Democrat and Republican Party is too degenerate and unfit to govern this country anymore.
That's why this country somewhere within the next two years will be under dictatorship. I have no doubt about the CIA going to overthrow it. And when the CIA overthrows this government, we can't blame nobody but ourselves. And I say we, I'm talking about us older folks. For a hundred years in America, we older folks have gone to the polls every election day and always end up voting for the lesser of the two evils. You try that for a hundred years, voting for the lesser of the two evils, and you find out one day there's nothing else left but the evil of the evil. And as many mistakes as the CIA's made, any old fool ought to be able to see what they're fixing to do. But in America, we too busy on making money. And in America, everybody got their mind on money. All we care about is money, and nobody gives a damn about a democracy. That's why we're going to lose democracy. Youngsters got a big job. Hmm. Pick up the paper one day and read where every governor in America had a tap on his telephone. Now, who the hell you think strong enough to tap the governor's phones in America? The Black Panthers? The Army admitted they have files on 25 million Americans. One and out of every eight Americans, they got a file on. School teachers, students, nuns, priests, ministers. Now, if they got 25 million files on all these folks, they got to have files on door pushers. Or can we really believe that these freaks are so mad they run down and have files on college kids and on nuns and on ministers, but they forgot to get files on the dope pushers? Say, you youngsters, you got a big job. Just keep your eye on the political forces. Yeah, we really messed it up. You realize this thing's so messed up, in order to become a U.S. Senator today, you must spend $2 million campaigning to get a $55,000 a year job. I know people who can't even count got enough sense to figure that out. Yeah. Governor Rockefeller spent $8 million in New York last year to become governor again. Hell, for $8 million, I could run for God. <laughs> And when? <laughs> That's something else we made a fool out of in this country. We really made a fool out of God. We start tricking with God when the kids is five years old. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. One nation under God, you've got to be out of your mind. You've got to be insane if you believe this is a nation under God. Right this moment, we got Indians up on reservation. <laughs> the Indians is living under some humane conditions unparalleled any place else in the world today. And we call this a nation under God. You've got to be tricky. One of the few countries in the world where the people that harvest the crop is dying for malnutrition. I tell you one thing. If this is an example of a nation under God, I sure as hell would hate to see one under the devil. <laughs> yeah, our God is that green Jesus. That's why we love the money. We put churches on every corner trying to fake folks out, but all we care about in this country is the money. I've always wondered, what do they have inside of a church other than God that make them lock their doors every night so I can't steal it? Well, we love the money. You know, this is one of the few countries in the world we love money so much you can kill your mama, get you some money, get you a good lawyer, walk into an American courtroom and plead temporary insanity and you damn near beat it every time. But I tell you what you better not do in America. You better not forge your check and get caught and get you a lawyer and walk into an American courtroom and try to plead temporary insanity. <laughs> or you kill your mama, you might be crazy, boy. You get to messing with that money, you got a lot of good sense and we gonna put you in jail. <laughs> but we love the money. You know what you can do in this country now? You can slip in some old woman's house tonight and take a poker and hit it in the head and kill her and rob her and get a nickel. 
And tomorrow morning when everybody wake up in this country find out you kill that old woman over nickel, this country be outraged. You ought to give them the lucky chair without a trial. Kill that old woman over a nickel. Slip into that same old woman's house tonight and take a poke and hit in the head and kill and rob her and get $10 million. And tomorrow morning when America find out, everybody in America be saying, she had no business with that kind of money round the house. <laughs> I say to you youngsters today in America, the very faith and destiny of America depends on you. If this country falls from the inside anytime soon, I say to us so-called good folks in America, we cannot blame the bad folks. No. See, the beautiful thing about the bad folks in America, which means we can't blame them for nothing that happens no more, is because the bad folks in this country have been thoroughly bad for 400 years. The problem is the good folks just decided to get good. Now we feel this repression coming down. Hmm. Everybody seem to be frightened of repression. A lot of people be trying to blame repression on Dick Nixon. No, you got to blame repression on yourselves. Because had you brought this moral force into the middle of the street during the LBJ administration, he would have brought repression down on you more than he did. Matter of fact, to be honest with you, had this moral force you got in the street today showed up during the Kennedy administration, he would have brought repression down on you. So we can't blame Nixon for the repression we see in the day. We have to blame ourselves because we're meeting this sick degenerate system with a moral force and a scanner. Yeah, a lot of people want to know where Dick Nixon come from. Where you think he came from? He homegrown American boy. That's right. Yeah, a lot of people want to act like he came down from the moon one day with some bazookas and say, up against the wall, I'm your president. No. <laughs> he homegrown American boy and he ran in the last presidential election and most of his mamas and daddies voted for him. That's how he got to be president of the United States. Repression? You young kids is talking about no more lies in your scanners. And what you see going on today is a sick, tired, degenerate nation reacting to fear. And whether you like it or not, it is man's basic right to become afraid and once that individual becomes afraid, it is his basic right to react to his fears, whether you like that or not. If I sit up here and look out and think I see a ghost, and my reaction to my fears is get the hell out of here, and I get so frightened and run so fast, I stomp 10 of y'all to death on the way out, hell, I can't go to jail. That's right, it's my basic right to become afraid, and once I become afraid, it's my basic right to react to my fears. And that's why I say you youngsters in America, you got to have a coolness, you got to have a wisdom unparalleled in the history of young folks. Hmm. You're dealing with a mad, insane nation, and if any of you have been around crazy folks before, you know damn good and well, crazy folks always misuse folks they love. You never heard of a crazy cat running outside in the street getting upset attacking a cat with a bazooka. So I say to you youngsters, I hope that you understand repression. You see, once you understand repression, then you'll understand that repression is more detrimental to the oppressor than it is to the oppressed. I know to many of you that's hard to believe, but understand me. Repression is more detrimental to the oppressor than it is to the oppressed. Well, let me give you an example. Let's say that we all in this room, let's say we all live in a one-room kitchenette. Now, in case some of y'all don't know what a one-room kitchenette is, 
Uh, that means you, you eat in that room, you sleep in that room, you go to toilet in that room, your icebox is in that room, you, you live in one room. That's known as a one-room kitchenette. You can usually tell it because it's one door. <laughs> now let's say all of us in this one-room kitchenette today, and a couple of these coffee drinkers decide they want some coffee. So in the one-room kitchenette, they walk up to the front of the room where the stove is, put some water in the tea kettle, put the tea kettle on to heat the water up for some coffee. Now by the time the water get hot, they even got so engrossed in a conversation, they forgot they put the tea kettle on. And then the tea kettle starts making little funny sounds. I dig what that's all about. The water, which is controlled by nature, the fire, which is controlled by nature, when you put water in a tea kettle and put it on fire, once it reach a certain boiling point, Nature reacts because certain laws have been violated. But nature's so beautiful before she reacts wildly, she gives you a warning. And when you hear the tea kettle going, it's not nature's way of alienating you. It's nature's way of saying, you violated me. Deal with me quick, or I'm going to have to react to it. Now let's say in this one room kitchenette when the tea kettle get the boiling good and the noise get to screaming, way back in the top bunk is Attorney General Mitchell <laughs> trying to sleep. He hear the noise, plus he don't like coffee anyway. So he tells his two deputy marshals, go down there to the front of the room and plug up that hole. And them two deputy marshals come down to the tea kettle and plug up the hole. Boop. No more noise for a few minutes. <laughs> That's called repression. And if you don't believe that repression is more detrimental to the oppressor than it is to the oppressed, just keep your eye on these two marshals standing next to the tea kettle. <laughs> See, nature has universal laws, and when you violate these universal laws, nature reacts. When a woman gets pregnant, she has labor pains. And a lot of women say, I sure wish I could have a baby without having them pains. You better understand labor pains. That's nothing more but nature's way of saying, hey, sis, if I was you, I wouldn't go to the movie tonight. <laughs> Let's say that we get us some of these brilliant doctors that come up with a pill to repress labor pains, right? Now you got them women. Oh, honey, I got me some pills. I don't have no more pains. I've had 12 babies with them pains. This one will be without pain. She repressed it. Conversation to go like this. Honey, I just don't understand. I was down, standing downtown shopping at Saks Fifth Avenue, and the baby just slipped out. <laughs> I looked at the salesman and said, give me a... There it is. What I'm trying to say is, you young kids that's in the street today is alienating a lot of Americans, but that's nothing more but nature's way of warning this sick, tired, degenerate nation that she better stop violating universal law and she better make some quick adjustments or nature gonna blow this thing. So in a one-room kitchenette, when the water get the boiling good, and you go and relieve the conditions that's causing it, everything's in order. But any time in a one-room kitchenette, the tea kid will get the boiling, and you get so alienated and get so roguish and bogus, you're going to go and plug up the tea kid 
You have just plugged up the last means of warning and expression nature going to give you. And baby, let me tell you, when a tea kettle blows up in a one-room kitchenette, everybody in the room get burned, including Brother Mitchell back up there on the top bar. Again, I say to you young folks in America today, America is nothing more but a one-room kitchenette. And what you young folks have been doing for the last five years, that noise that's been alienating so many people, that sound that Nixon keeps saying, be quiet, might be the last one in this sick country going to get. A lot of people don't understand revolution. A lot of people sit around and read all them old slick books, read Karl Marx and all that, and think they understand revolution. You better understand revolution. A lot of these freaks in this country believe revolution is, is controlled by man. I say to you youngsters today, revolution never have and never will be controlled by man. Revolution always have and always will be controlled by nature. See, when you understand revolution, and it don't take no wisdom to understand revolution, just deal with nature. Let's read all them old slick books. Revolution is nothing more but an extension of evolution. Evolution is nothing more but a gradual naturistic change that after long periods of time leads into revolution, which is quick change. When a woman gets pregnant, the first nine months of the gestation period is evolution. When the water bag breaks, that's revolution, baby. And if you think you can stop nature's revolution with some National Guardmen and some cops, I tell you what you do. You find a woman that's nine months pregnant, and when her water bag breaks, you go out and get all the National Guardmen on the face of this earth and get all the cops on the face of this earth and see if you can cross her legs and keep the baby in her. <laughs> Nature's law is simple and sweet. It says after nine months pregnancy is up, she gonna drop that baby if it means death to the mother and the child. I say to you youngsters in America today, America's nine months pregnancy is just about up and that baby gonna fall if it means death to the mother and the child. You got a big job and you haven't got much time. You see, America has violated universal law so tremendously, yes, she had dared put property rights ahead of human rights. And understand, young folks, when you put property rights ahead of human rights, understand you're tampering with nature. Hmm. That's right. You see, property rights is controlled by man, and human rights is controlled by nature. You want to know what happens to you when you put property rights ahead of human rights? You take a tight shoe and put on your foot. The shoe represents property rights because the shoe was created by man. That foot represents human rights because it was created by nature. You put a tight shoe on your foot and see what happened. Well, start limping. Everybody knows something wrong. Nature's way because she defies anything to rub against her own. Say, hey, man, what's wrong with your foot? Man, this damn shoe is so tight. Why don't you take it off? Say, it's too pretty. What? Yeah, man, you know how much I paid for this shoe? So what you gonna do? Say, so a cat told me I can go down to the drugstore and take me some aspirins and repress the pain. <laughs> he gets his aspirins, the next time you see him, he be walking pretty straight. One day he looked down there and he got a big coin on his foot. Why? Nature refused to have anything rub against her own. 
Listen to me good now. You put a tight shoe that man made on a foot that nature made, you're going to get a corn. And if you keep wearing that shoe, that corn is going to turn into a callus. And if you keep wearing that tight shoe, that callus is going to turn into a bunion. And if you keep wearing that tight shoe, that bunion will wear that shoe out. There's never been a shoe in the history of man strong enough to wear out a pair of nature's feet. I say to you young folks in America today, the decent folks in this country got a callus around their soul and if the shoe don't back up quick, it's coming down. The youngsters got a big job. I say you have a big job because you have to understand where America started from, to understand where America is, then you'll understand where America's going. A lot of people get uptight the way folks treat you in America, don't like your long hair, don't like the way you dress. Well, they ain't just picking on you. You know, if Christ came back to America today with that hippie hairstyle and that funny looking gown he got on, they'd run him all the way out the country. And if he refused to go, they'd tie him to a peace symbol and roll him off a cliff. Name one. I, uh, lady or ma'am or whoever you are. <laughs> I feel that there's enough folks walking around saying good things about America. You see, if you was a doctor lady and I came to you with a brain tumor by you telling me about how good my teeth look and how good my eyes are, ain't gonna save me. I tried to say earlier, lady, that there was too many good Germans that was too busy talking about the nice features of them Nazis, that that boss didn't rise up to talk about that bad, sick, insane feature of them Nazis. So probably some of your loved ones as well as mine got wiped out because they was too busy sitting around Nazi Germany talking about the good features of Hitler. If I may proceed now, I have no doubt, lady, that you, you have plenty of good features, but I say to you, one day go up on the Indian reservation and discuss the good features of America with the Indians. <laughs> go out into the fields with the sharecroppers that's harvesting your crop that you're going to eat that's dying from malnutrition and discuss the good features with them. Go to the 44 million Americans that go to bed every night hungry in America while we pay farmers billions of dollars not to plant crops and discuss the good features with them. No. 
You know, America might be the first country in the history of the world that didn't only write the book, but did a movie on how she gonna fall. You wanna have fun one day, go see a movie called Frankenstein. <laughs> you know, with my dumb, stupid self, I always thought Frankenstein was a bad cat. Till I got married and had some kids. You know, kids love Frankenstein. Dig it? Yeah, the number one Halloween costumes they sell Frankenstein outfits. <laughs> now let me tell you something about young kids. Young kids ain't never wanted to play somebody bad. I look at my kids and say, I'm Frankenstein, Daddy. And dig, I ain't never met a kid in my life wanted to play Santa Claus. <laughs> dig it? The good cat that I thought was good, don't know kids want to be, and the bad cat that I thought was bad, they always tell me, Frankenstein, Frankenstein. <laughs> if you think I'm playing, come Christmas one year, you take some little kids down to the department store and see what kind of hell you got to go through to get them to sit on Santa's lap. <laughs> then I sit and I looked at Frankenstein. Those of you that haven't seen the movie, please see it. When I say see it, I don't mean, I mean go with some kids, because kids feel sorry for Frankenstein. Right, Frankenstein was in the grave. And Bella Lugosi, dig it, went and got him out. And got to hooking all kind of strange stuff to him. And no doubt created a monster. And I'm sitting there in my little square cell, every time I see Frankie, I get scared because I didn't have the wisdom to watch that movie right. You know who Frankenstein was scared of? Bella Lugosi. I didn't have enough wisdom to be afraid of who the monster was scared of. That's right, every time Frankie went out and killed one of them ladies, he wasn't killing for herself. That was the mad scientist wanted her. And I'm so busy being hung up on Frankenstein, I let Bella Lugosi slip by. I mean, in my wildest madness, I've got to be afraid of who the monster scared of. Hmm. Dig it, check that flick out. He go out there and get him out the graveyard. He can't do no damage to nobody else. He dead. He pull him out, hook all that stuff to him, and get him to doing bad things. And one day he overshot Frankie. And Frankie backed up on him. And he told Frankie about the good features of being a monster. <laughs> and he thought Frankie was listening. And Frankie reached for him, he said, be non-violent for him. Frankie said, okay, and he hugged him to death. <laughs> and when he got to squeezing Bella Lugosi, he was trying to get away and he kicked over the lamp. And the lab caught on fire. And that was the end. The lab burnt down. Bella Lugosi burned up. Frankie burned up. <laughs> Just think about who's the only one in the room didn't have nothing to lose. Frankenstein, because he's dead to begin with, right? <laughs> now what I want to show you, I want to show you America today. And we was in Africa minding our business. She came over there and dug us up. <laughs> brought black folks to America and made a monster out of us. And while everybody was scared of us, who was we scared of? The white police, the white sheriff, the white citizen council, the white mayor, the white governor, the white folks. A lot of you youngsters made the same mistake we made looking at the movie. You wasn't afraid of who the monster was afraid of. Hmm. Well, one day in the early 1960s, he overshot us. And we backed up on him in the streets. <laughs> now most young folks is backing up on him. And I say, if the man's not very careful, 
He might sit in and watch his whole lab burn. And every time you youngsters discuss the bad features of America and try to make those bad features good features, you're like a fireman helping put the fire out. I beg you young folks in America today to please understand this country. A lot of young folks all over the country was upset over what happened here last year at Kent University. A lot of young folks was upset over what happened at Jackson, Mississippi. I say to you young folks today in America, had you understood America, Kent University wouldn't have upset you too much. Get you a good history book. Read about American history. Read about the founding fathers. Read some of them good features about this country. In the history book, then get you one that white folks wrote so you won't say that somebody trying to trick you. <laughs> yeah, open up that history book and read the good features. Find out who the Puritan pilgrims was. Find out who that early American was that founded this country. Read this in the history book. Them good features said there wasn't nothing but a bunch of cutthroat, degenerate bandits and criminals that the king and queen let out them jails and dungeons because they didn't want to kill them and put them on that big boat knowing the boat wasn't going to make it and they lucked up and got here. <laughs> they read about them. It's in there. Said they came to these shores and discovered a country that was already occupied. How in the hell you gonna discover something that somebody else owned and not be a gangster? <laughs> it's like I walk out of here today and you and your lady sitting in your brand new automobile. I say, ooh, that's yours, a beautiful automobile. I think I'll discover it. Take it home with me and tell my wife and loved ones and friends I discovered this beautiful automobile. My kid said, well, Daddy, was anyone in it? Said, yeah, it was a car full of folks. So he said, well, where are they not? Say, I have them happily living up on a reservation. <laughs> Read about the founding fathers. Nothing that happens today would upset you. It's in there. Say they landed at the Plymouth Rock and shot and murdered their way all the way across to California. <laughs> and what happened at Kent surprised you? They haven't read your history. You realize how many people he wiped out across this country to put these colleges and institutions, check back and find out what was here before these buildings was here and find out what means he used to get people off these lands to build what he wanted to build. And you'd be surprised how many people have died on these very spots. Youngsters got a big job. These cats that came here was, was in a sick, weird, degenerate bag. And you know, if you really want to know how sick them founding fathers was, get you a good anthropology book, Study of Man, and you find out that down through the years, ever since the first man, that basic man's behavior pattern never differed that much from one man to another man till we got to the American man. It's the only cat in the history of man created a wild woolly west. <laughs> the, the sick as the Romans was, America's was the first ones to be a cowboy. Never in the history of man was there a cowboy till it got to America. You realize how sick and degenerate this cat had to be? You realize how sick you got to be to want to be a cowboy? A big old hat on your head, old toe pinching shoes, strap two guns around your belly and put an LBJ look on your face talking about law and order. <laughs> and, and to this very day, America still got a cowboy mentality. Check out this man's history, them founding fathers, them sick degenerates, 
so sick they had to be a cowboy and kill one another for physical therapy. One day, cowboys had a big meeting. He said, we got a problem. He said, what's the problem, hombre? He said, we wiping out one another. He said, well, cowboy, got to kill somebody to be cowboy. He said, well, we got a master plan. He said, what's that? He said, we going to find somebody else to kill. Say who? Say that's not important. Say what's important is what we gonna name them. Say what you gonna name them? Say we gonna call them engines. And we'll play the mighty game of cowboy and engine. Say well who gonna be the engine? Say uh, look out there in the valley, tell that red boy to come here. Come here red boy. <laughs> yeah, what you want, Kim Osavi? You the engine, boy. Say the what? What's that? Now you find out, take that gun and run for the hills. <laughs> the red man made a pretty good little low engine until he got hip to what was going down. Once he found out what was happening, he hurried up back to the great white father's mansion, knocked on the door. <laughs> great white father come, looked out the door and said, yeah, what do you want, red boy? And me just come to tell you, me not going to be your engine no more. <laughs> Say, what? You red-faced, moccasin-wearing freak, who in the... <laughs> Red man say, great white father, call me all the names you want to call me. Me still not going to be your engine no more. Rather than the cowboy being outdone, he looked at the red man and said, well, uh, you just want to quit because you found out cowboy got too much manhood for you, huh, boy? Red man say, uh, great white father, your manhood's never bothered us. We checked that out the first day you landed at the Plymouth Rock. <laughs> so well, you got to admit we some mean hombres. We killed too good for you. That's why you want to quit. Say, that didn't surprise us. Say, you right, you a mean hombre. You do mean, vicious things, but it didn't surprise us. Raped our women, killed our kids, and burned our village down, and all of that didn't surprise us. We kind of expected that out of you. Cabo said, oh, come on, engine. Damn it, you know we surprised you on something. That's why you want to quit. I said, yes, yes, my white brother, you did surprise us on something. But it wasn't you raping our women and killing our kids and burning our village down. That didn't surprise us. What surprised us, my great white brother, after you do all those vicious things to us, you go all over the world trying to convince man that red man is the savage. <laughs> We're not going to be your engine no more. Yeah, you surprised us. Every time the Calvary win, it's a grand victory. When the Indians win, it's a grand massacre. You did surprise us. You surprised us up on the Indian reservation trying to convince my kids that Columbus discovered America. We're not going to be your engine no more. Great white father said, OK, boy. You don't want to be the engine no more. We put you up on the reservation, kill you anyway. Red man said, great white father, don't explain to me none of your hangups no more. Do whatever you feel you have to do. Just understand one thing, whatever you do to us from this day on, you're doing to a red man and not to your engine. Red man rode off the reservation. Great white father had everything working pretty mellow. All his tricks was working. Everything was together. That is, except one thing, no engine. Great white father held big meeting in the mansion, said, we got to get us an engine. Cowboy can't be cowboy without an engine. Said, well, it ain't going to work. We went up on the reservation. He ain't coming. Damn him. Get somebody else. Say, who? Say, uh, tell that Jew to come here. Come here, Jew boy. Yeah, what you want? You the engine. The what? We're the merchants. <laughs> Damn it, Jew, we say you the engine. Engine, what's that? You find out. 
Take that gun, run for the hills. Jew made a pretty hip little old engine till he got hip to what was going on. Didn't take him too long, cause the Jew ain't never been nobody's fool. He always had some smarts. Matter of fact, the Jew was so hip, he damn near found out what was going down before he left. So he hurried back to the great white father's mansion, beat on the door. Great white father looked out the window and said, yeah, what do you want, Amy? That we just left the temple. Say, so what? Say, so what? We decided we're not going to be your engine no more. Say, okay, Jew, if you don't want to be the engine no more, you have to do something for us. What do you want to do? Jew said, I don't know. We'll think about it. Great white father said, okay, Jew, and while you're thinking about it, we'll be watching you. Hmm. <laughs> You know to this very day the Jew is still thinking about it? And the great white father still watching him? Well, like I say, all the tricks was together. Great white father had it going. All his game was working. All his tricks was working. Everything was together except one thing. No engine. Matter of fact, he gone longer this time than he ever gone without an engine. Three weeks, four days. I was really getting to him. He got to shooting at his wife and stomping at his kids. Again, great white father had big meeting in mansion. Said, we got to get us an engine today. Said, who we gonna get? Said, who's left? Tell that Irishman to come and say, oh no, not that big foot, dumb, clob hopping freak. Said, better him than my wife. Come here, Irishman. Hear what y'all want. Are you the engine, boy? Say, the what? What's that? Say, you find out, take that gun and run for the hills. The Irishman made a pretty hip little old engine because he didn't get as hip as the Jew as quick as he did, but he got hip. And when he did, the Irishman hurried up back to the great white father's mansion, knocked on the door. Great white father looked out and said, yeah, what do you want, Irishman? So I just come to tell you we're not going to be your engine no more. Say, you dumb freak, who you been talking to them? Damn Jews. <laughs> say, okay, Irishman, if you don't want to be the engine no more, you have to do something for us. What do you want to do? Irishman thought about it for a while, say, uh, we'll be your police. <laughs> be the what? Oh, dumb Irish, who in the hell ever heard of Irish cop? Say, wait a minute, don't move, stay right there, I'll be right back. Great white father rushed into the big mansion to explain this funny joke to super white father at this dumb, clumsy Irishman talk about being the police. So great white father rushed up to super white father and said, come here, Rocky. <laughs> super white father said, yes, white boy, what do you want? He said, you believe that dumb, stupid Irishman's outside saying if we relieve him from being the engine, he'll be our police? Super white father said, well, that's the cleverest thing I've heard since we landed at the Plymouth. So oh, come on, super white father, you know that Irishman too dumb to be the police? Hey, damn you white boy, shut up and sit on the floor. I said that's the cleverest thing I heard, the Irishman wanting to be the police. He said, but super white father, you know he too dumb. Shut up, I said, boy, that's who you want to be the police. Somebody so dumb they don't know right from wrong. And anything we do wrong, we'll tell them it's right. And anybody try to interfere with us, we'll tell them they're wrong. <laughs> Woo, you sure is smart. That's why you super white folks. So it came to pass the Irishman became the police. Again, everything was working pretty mellow. All this system was working. All his tricks was working. Everything was together except one thing. No more engines. Again, great white father held big meat and said, we got to get his ninja. Can't go another day without an ninja. Say, who we gonna get? Say, look down in the valley, who's left? They tell that Italian to come here. Come here, you wop. <laughs> yeah, what for you want with me? Say, you the engine, you wop. Say, engine, what's that? Say, you find out. Let that monkey go. Get rid of that organ grinder. Take that gun and run for the hills. The Italian made a pretty hip little old engine. Matter of fact, if you really want to know what the cowboy was all about, you should all read the story of Psycho and Vanzetti. 
Matter of fact, if I had my way, I would make it mandatory by law that every child in America that reached the tender age of 12 by law would be forced to read the story of Psycho and Vanzetti. And then you'd have no doubt what the cowboy was all about. But like I say, Italian made a pretty hip little end until he got hip to what was going down. He too hurried back to the mansion, beat on the door. Great white father rushed to the door and said, yeah, what do you want, Italian? Said, we just come to tell you we're not going to be the engine no more. I said, okay, Italian, if you don't want to be the engine no more, you have to do something for us. What do you want to do? Italian said, I don't know. We'll do anything you want us to do except be the engine. You say, anything? Say, yeah, anything. Say, okay, Italian, how about pushing a little dope for us? Say, what? Say, how about pushing a little dope for us? Say, oh, no, you just want to get us put in jail. How in the hell can you get put in jail when we own the Irish police? <laughs> they cannot arrest no one until we tell them to. And matter of fact, if we tell them to arrest you, you don't have to do nothing wrong. Say, no, nah, even, even if the Irish cops don't arrest us, what about the parents? The American people will react. So what do you mean? You just can't go around pushing dope to people's kids and the police not doing anything. The American people will rebel. So you don't have to worry about that. Say why? Say we got a program we'll have most Americans so dumb and stupid they'll never know what's going on. Say how are you going to have all Americans dumb and stupid? Say we got a master plan. Say what do you call it? It's called education. <laughs> Say, how does it work? Say, it's simple. Instead of educating them, you indoctrinate them, and they'll never know there's a difference between an education and an indoctrination. As a matter of fact, we'll guarantee you there'll come a day in America where the average American will be so dumb and stupid they'll never have the wisdom to figure out how a nine-year-old kid in New York or Chicago or Cleveland can find a heroin man, but the FBI cannot find him. and say, okay, we'll do it. And so the Italian became the symbol of crime in America. The Italians became the symbol of gangsterism in America. The Italians became the symbol of murder in America. And while all of us old, slimy, insane, degenerate Americans was blaming all the crime and gangsterism and murder on the Italians, the real gangsters and the real murderers, the real criminals, the great white father, he was permitted to walk among us and be recognized as statesmen. <laughs> oh, that slimy degenerate gives large grants to all the colleges and universities. He tries to control everybody on the board of directors. That's what the problem is. Today, young folks in these college institutions are saying, no more lies, damn it, teach me how to live instead of teach me how to make a living. <laughs> well, all his tricks was working. Everything was mellow. Oh, he had his game uptight, except no, it was worse than that. Not only did he have no more engines, wasn't no more left. Great white father held a meeting in the mansion, said, we got to get engines, there ain't no more left. Said, well, cowboy can't be cowboy without someone to kill. Say, what are we going to do, hombre? Say, tonight we'll choose sides, and tomorrow morning at 12 noon, we'll meet in front of the OK Corral and have a shootout. What a glorious thing. Great white father going to wipe out one another. That night they chose sides. 
The next morning at 8 o'clock, they was all sitting around the breakfast table looking at one another with the dead eye, knowing that in less than four hours, the great white father would wipe out great white father. That is, the great white out that never happened. You see, at 8.20 that morning, something happened. I never will forget that. <laughs> at 8.20 that morning, less than four hours before the great white father was going to wipe out one another, the niggas showed up at the mansion. <laughs> Knocked on the door. Great white father rushed to the door and looked down and said, Yeah, what do you want, nigga? Uh, say, uh, 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 Mr. White folks, uh, we just wanted to know if we could apply for that engine job. <laughs> nigga, what you say? Say, say, we want to know if we can become the new engine. Say, hell no, nigga. That's why you the nigga, nigga. <laughs> Dumb as you is. Wait there, don't move. I'll be right back. Great white father rushed inside the mansion to show this old dumb, stupid nigga to super white father. He said, come, come, come here, super white father. Say, look out the window, look at that dumb ignorant nigga. He's so dumb, he want to be the engine. Super white father came, looked out the window. Said, come here, white boy. Say, yeah, what I done now? Nah. Say, look at that nigga out there. That ain't no ordinary nigga. He said, well, well they all look alike to me. <laughs> Damn you white boy, sometime I don't know how you got in here with us. Look at that nigga, that's no ordinary nigga. Look at him, standing tall. Lips all tucked in. <laughs> Brooks Brothers suit on. Phi Beta Kappa Key from Harvard and Yale. That nigga look more like us than us. Tell that nigga to come in here. Come in, nigga. Yes, sir. Uh, nigga, I understand you want to be the engine. Uh, yes, Miss White folks. Okay, nigga, that's a funny joke. Now get the hell on out of here before we hurt you. No, Miss White folks, we really want to be the engine. Nigga, do you know we do the engines? Yes, Miss, you're damn lying, nigga. Don't you lie to me. When the hell you could know that we do the engines and want to be one? Y yeah, yes, Miss White folks, we know. Shut up, nigga. Let me tell you what we do the engines. We rape their women, kill their kids, and burn their village down. Uh, you didn't know that, did you, nigga? Uh, yes, Mr. White folk. You mean to tell me, nigga, you know what we do the engines and you still want to be one? Yes, sir. Why, nigga, why? Because you, you see, Mr. White folks, y'all do the same thing to niggas, but at least they tell us the engine get to carry a gun. I told you that wasn't all that, nigga. Okay, nigga. You can be the engine. And so it came to pass. We became the new engine. <clears throat> and that's when Great White Father put us in a trick. See, we thought once we became the new engine, we'd be relieved of our nigga duties. No, he said, you still the nigga too. You volunteered for that engine gig. <laughs> Now, being the engine ain't no big thing because everybody at some time or another had been the engine in this country. But I say to you today in America, you never know what being the engine is until you have to be the nigger too. Hmm. Yeah, the young blacks became the new engines and the old blacks was forced to continue to be the nigger. That's a hell of a thing when the cowboy wake up early in the morning and go out and lynch him one of his young black engines and that nigga mammy had to wash her son's blood out the cowboy's shirt when she washed the boss's clothes that night. You never know what being the engine is until you have to be the nigga too. One day we got hip to what was going down. Yep. When we got hit, we hurried up back to the great white father's mansion because we didn't go to the front door. We went to the back and knocked. Great white father looked out the door and said, what you doing, nigga? Said, we just come to tell you we ain't going to be the engine no more, so you better get off that porch, nigga, before I hurt you. Well, damn, man, you let everybody else go. 
but us. You know, we was forced to continue to be the engine for a whole decade, the decade of the 60s. <laughs> That's what all the rumbling was about. Matter of fact, we would probably still be the engine today had it not been for, thank God, for Stokely Carmichael and Rap Brown. Yeah, Brother Stokely and Brother Rap taught us one good lesson. He said, my black brother, if you don't want to be the engine anymore, stop looking like the engine. I said, what do you mean, Stokely? What do you mean, Rap? So you take the wall paint off your face, get the feather out your cap, throw them beads away and quit making them damn blankets. And when you stop looking like the engine, black brother, he'll understand that you not. Look like yourself, because black is beautiful. And we weren't talking about black was beautiful at the expense that white was ugly. We was talking about black was beautiful because the system had warped our minds so bad up until five years ago, most black folks believed black was ugly. Well, we listened to Brother Stokeland, we listened to Brother Rapp, we stopped looking like the engine. We let our hair grow out the way nature meant for it to grow out. We say, anybody don't like nappy hair, go to hell. <laughs> we stopped being ashamed of our black face. We don't use all that old bleaching cream anymore. We stopped being ashamed of our big lips. We don't tuck our lips in no more. We let them all hang out. Ain't y'all ashamed them big old funny looking lips? Used to be. How come y'all ain't shamed no more? Well, we just realized man couldn't live without a little love and all big lips mean is when I reach to kiss my lady, chances are I ain't gonna miss her. <laughs> we ain't ashamed of our big old wide nose anymore. Ain't y'all ain't y'all ashamed them funny looking old noses? Used to be. Well, how come y'all ain't shamed no more? Realize through nature, man couldn't live without breathing in air. And all wide nose mean that I can breathe in more air than you. That's why every time they take a white cat to the hospital, they got to put that oxygen tent on his little nose just before they get him in the ambulance. That's a hundred dollars before they even find out what's wrong with it. And we don't have to go that route. Hey, Dr. Jabbo Jones laying over there. What's wrong with him? I don't know. He's getting too much air. Plug up one of his nostrils. <laughs> we stopped being ashamed of the way we talk. I don't know why them colored folks don't apply themselves and learn how to speak the English language good like us white folks in America. I wish all you white folks in America would get on a jet plane one day and fly to London, England and listen to that Englishman talk and you find out you can't speak English neither. <laughs> the only difference between you and me, hell, we know we can't talk, and we know you can't talk. So what the hell we want to run around sounding like you for? You see some nigga running through the black ghetto talking about, gosh. You know, you listen to them coloreds talk and you just can't understand what they're saying most of the time. That's right. That ain't no lie. And we listen to you whites talk and we can't understand what you're saying most of the time. Of course, we don't make no big issue out of it because we feel you're doing the best you can. <laughs> but you know, if you white folks in America would listen to one and just listen to each other talk. See, we listen to you all the time. Get you a tape recorder and record your conversation. Then play it back and write it down. And then get you an English dictionary. See how many words you use you can't find in the English dictionary. Yeah, listen to yourself talk. We listen to you all the time. Jesus Christ, Chucky, let's go get some nookie. <laughs> so 
now what? I just, what in the hell is Nookie? My English speaking friend. I checked every English dictionary, can't find no Nookie, but the way you be looking for it, I know it exists. Yeah, I'm 38 years old, been all the way around the world. I still don't know what Nookie is. Just sound like something I ain't never had and don't never want. I'll just be happy with my wife and eight kids. Damn Nookie, whatever it might be, y'all. Well, after a whole decade of not looking like the engine, great white father got hip. And it happened. He decided to release us from being the engine. It happened one day in 1969. Great white father decided to release us from being the engine. And that's when we put him in the super trick. We said, we're not going to be your nigger no more neither. That was a glorious day in America for black folks, but it was a sad day in America for America because it meant the first time in the history of America she was without a nigger and an engine at the same time. <laughs> that had never happened before. There was brief period she didn't have engines, but she always had the niggers to fall back on. Not only do America not have a nigger or engine, she's fixing to greet a new decade, the decade of the 70s, without a nigger Horn engine. A lot of people say she'll make it. Say, no, cowboy is still a cowboy. Cowboy needs an engine. To be honest with you, I was surprised America made the whole month of January 1970 without a nigger or an engine. A whole month. She made February of 1970 without a nigger or an engine. That surprised me, although February was a short month. She made March and she made April. January, February, March, and April of 1970, America made without a nigger or an engine. A lot of people say, I think she'll go all the way. Say, no, look at the thick, slimy, degenerate creep. Cowboy will always be the cowboy. Cowboy needs a nigger and an engine. Four months, January, February, March, in April of 1970 without a nigger or engine. And then it happened. Oh, how well did it happen? How well do you youngsters here at Kent University know it happened? May the 4th, 1970, the cowboy held the biggest meet never held in the history of the mansion. Say, we got to get us a nigger and engine today. Say, my God, man, there's no more left. Say, look down in the valley. There's our new engines. There's our new niggas. Say, my God, man, those are our white kids. Say, they used to be. They're the new niggas and the new engines. at Kent University last year was all about. May the 4th, 1970, was you young white kids' inauguration day. That was the day, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that you young white kids in America became America's new nigger and became America's new engine. Kent University just happened to be the area. Different people become niggers at different places. We became in Mississippi, Georgia, and Alabama. We must say one thing. 
You new niggas really surprised us ex-niggas the way you moved into your nigga duty so groovy. <laughs> Woo! Yeah, by the nightfall of May the 4th, 1970, the whole world knew who the new niggas and the new engines was. Nobody ever got the message across that quick. In case you run across some young white kids in America today that don't believe they're the new niggas and the new engines, tell them, please don't take my word for it. Tell them to listen to them talk shows on radio and television. Tell them to listen to the older white folks today discussing you younger white folks. They sound the same way talking about you today. They used to sound talking about us in the 60s. Yeah, listen to them older white folks discussing you younger white folks on them talk shows today. Uh, what's wrong with them? <laughs> Who do they think they are? What do they want? Look at them, they just look so strange and smell so funny. <laughs> Whenever the cowboy get him a new nigga and a new engine, he always gets him a fringe benefit that goes along with that. And that fringe benefit is that all niggas and all engines look alike. Oh, they proved that last year down there in, uh, when them kids burned that bank down in California and uh, Santa Barbara. And they burned that bank down and the, the bank opened up at another place and they came back that night and tried to burn it down again. And they killed that white kid in front of the bank. He was trying to put the fire out. All niggas and all engines do look alike. <laughs> well, I don't have to tell you youngsters that here at Kent University, you understand that more than any of us. They proved that last year right here on that campus. One of them girls that got shot through the head, she wasn't no demonstrator. She was on her way to the parking lot to get into her car and drive away, and she got shot right through the head. And to this day, no one's had to answer for that murder because all niggas do look alike. They proved that with one of the fellas that was killed here. One of the two of them. One of them, I don't remember his name. He was an honor student in ROTC. Loved it. <laughs> Loved it to death. I say to you youngsters today in America, you got a big job. You haven't got much time. You young folks in America are gonna have to write the history of what happened here at Kent University. Matter of fact, it's a short history. Let's write it today. May the 4th, 1970, Kent University, located in Kent, Ohio. National Guardmen moved upon the college campus. Some white folks decided the soldiers shouldn't be on the college campus, so they marched on the soldiers. They threw sticks and stones at the soldiers. They didn't believe the soldiers would shoot. The soldiers shot, and four of them lay dead. So what are we gonna call this chapter? Hey, let's check the history book. They say history repeats itself. See if it ever happened before and see what they call it. Let's go back 100 years to 1870. See if history repeats. Nah, no, nah. History, let's try 200 years. Let's go back to 1770 since they're always talking about history repeats. Well, I'll be damned. 1770, Boston, Massachusetts. The British moved soldiers into Boston one day. <laughs> Some white folks decided that the British soldiers shouldn't be in Boston, so they marched on the Boston Commons one night. They threw snowballs at the British soldiers. They didn't believe the soldiers would shoot. The soldiers shot, and four of them laid dead.
What do they call that chapter? Oh, the shot that was heard around the world. <laughs> Between 1770 and 1776, this country went through some changes unparalleled in the history of America. I say to you youngsters today in America, if America's not very careful, between 1900 and 70 and 1976, mother just might go through some more changes. <laughs> what you youngsters are saying to America today, the same as you said a year ago tomorrow, at this very campus you were saying to America, you're sick, mama. And all the old slimy degenerate freaks kept saying, you're too young, you're not a doctor. How do you know America's sick? I said, well, it goes way back. They left a medical record for mother. And, and the medical record, they wrote it so clear and so plain, you don't need no medical background to, to look at mother's health chart. Uh, that, that medical record's called the United States Constitution. And when you read the Constitution, it tells you what Mother America is supposed to act like, think like, talk like, walk like, and feel like when she's healthy. And from reading the Constitution and looking at Mother America, she's been sick for a long time. young folks is trying to get America to take the examination and go in for the cure. I knew America was sick, but not until what happened here at Kent University last year did I realize Mother America was crazy too. <laughs> Thank God they left us a prescription for Mama. They got a prescription they left for us. Say when Mama get too sassy, and get too crazy to come in and take the cure. Them same guys that wrote out a constitution, which was her medical chart, also left us a prescription which tells us how we're supposed to deal with Mother America. Y'all check out that prescription one day. It's a simple prescription. They didn't write it in Latin because they wanted everybody to understand what the medicine is. It's called the Declaration of Independence. <laughs> and it's a simple. It's a simple prescription, it reads, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and endowed by the Creator with certain and inalienable rights that when these rights are destroyed over long periods of time, it is your duty to destroy or abolish that government. So I say to you young folks today, as I leave you, you got a big job. You have an important job. You have an important job because America is worth saving at the expense of alienating your mother, your father, the president, and even the vice president. <laughs> I say to you young folks in America, America is worth saving because you see, there's nothing really wrong with the United States Constitution that a little enforcement for everybody wouldn't straighten out. <laughs> Stay strong. Thank you. God bless you. Make you have fun. Peace and freedom. <laughs>